In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Today I would like to give you an explanation of the Holy Gospel, which is obscure in many ways and also contains a great deal of doctrine. Our Lord is speaking to his disciples after the Last Supper. So this is before his crucifixion, before crossing to the uh, Garden of Olives for the agony of the garden. He says, I go to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? The apostles are so stricken with sadness upon his leaving that they do not ask this question. And our Lord gives them this mild rebuke for not asking, for they would learn, if they asked, that he is going to his glory. For our Lord's crucifixion is his glory. It is not his shame. It is his glory because by his crucifixion, he, overcome, he overcame death and sin. And there is no greater gift by which to save humanity than to overcome these two things, sin and what sin leads to, death. And therefore, he is the savior of the world, and he purchases the entire human race by his blood in this glorious sacrifice that will take place. So this is his glory, that he be crucified and that he become a sacrificial victim. They would learn that if they had asked. But he says, but because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow hath filled your heart. So again, he gives them a slight rebuke. But I tell you the truth, he says, it is expedient to you that I go, for if I go not, the paraclete will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. The problem is that his disciples have not yet received the Holy Ghost and are therefore attached to Christ in an excessively human way. This is one of the reasons for Christ's departure, that their human attachment to him be purified so that they can receive the Holy Ghost. Remember that he said to Thomas, blessed are they that have not seen, yet have believed. On Pentecost, the Holy Ghost will transform them from sad and timid men who are hiding from the Jews into fearless and enlightened men who go set out and convert the whole world and all of them will be martyred. The one exception being St. John the Apostle, but he too went through a martyrdom because he was lowered into a cauldron of boiling oil before the Latin gate in Rome, which is near to today's St. John Lateran Church. <clears throat> and the, uh, that feast we celebrate this week known as St. John before the Latin Gate. But he was preserved from dying by God because he had other work to do. He had to write his holy gospel. So the, they were transformed completely by the Holy Ghost and you can see that in the Acts of the Apostles. Now Christ calls the Holy Ghost the paraclete, which means consoler. The idea is that he will fill the apostles with joy. This verse also proves the distinction of the divine persons, since our, Lord's, our Lord says that he will send the Holy Ghost through the apostles. If he sends the Holy Ghost, that means the Son is distinct from the Holy Ghost. And we already know that the Son is distinct from the Father, just by definition, because no one can be both a Father and a Son at the same time. So the sacred scriptures contain very clearly the distinction of the three divine persons. The sending of the Holy Ghost by God, the Son, is proof as well of the fact that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. You may know that the Eastern schismatics say he proceeds only from the Father, and they reproach Rome for saying 
filioque, that is, the father and the son. But this is proof positive because it is impossible that the son could send the Holy Ghost unless the Holy Ghost proceeded from the son. It is also true that if he did not proceed also from the son as well as the father, he would not be distinguished from the son. Then the son and the Holy Ghost would be one person. But those are theological matters that are very important but may be a little difficult to understand for a layperson. And he says that he will convince the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. Now the word convince here means convict. You must remember that the, the, what we use in our translations, what we read from the pulpit, is a translation that was done in Douay and in Reims in the 1580s and which was updated in the, 17, in the middle of the 18th century, of the 1750s, by a Bishop Challoner because the English of the 1580s was too old. But the reason we use that is because all of the subsequent translations that did, we might say, modernize certain words and keep them in their modern meaning, <clears throat> are deficient in one way or the other. So we stick to the Douay Reims version of the Bible in English. So convince would now mean convict. So the Holy Ghost will convict the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. And by the way, that is an argument, a very strong argument, of why the church uses Latin. In a matter of perhaps not even 300 years, that word convince has changed. However, the church in using Latin preserves all of the meaning that the words, the theological words ever had. So we can read St. Augustine from the fourth century and all of the Latin meaning is the same. We can read the early Christian writers from the third and second and first centuries. All of the meaning is the same. And all of that meaning is preserved in all of the documents of the church, all of the theology of the church. We read St. Thomas Aquinas from the 13th century everything's the same. St. Robert Bellarmine from the 16th century, it's all the same. Because there is no change in God, as the epistle says, not even a hint. And all of that doctrine must remain the same. And even in the past 50 years, words have changed in English. So that's why if you don't understand why the church has its sacred liturgy in Latin, why it has its documents in Latin, is to preserve that continuity of doctrine. So what does this mean? The, the world here does not mean the entire planet. That doesn't mean it's going to, the Holy Ghost is going to convict the whole planet and send it to hell. It doesn't mean that. The world refers to, that, to the, the, the world in the pejorative sense, pejorative sense, and that is worldly Jews and Gentiles who do not or will not believe in Christ. So the worldly, the unbelieving, the apostates, the heretics, schismatics, people who do not belong to his church, that's what it refers to. And the Holy Ghost will reprove them and accuse them he will convict them in the sense that he will present arguments concluding to their guilt. He will convict them of the sin of infidelity in as much as after having seen all of the evidence of Christ's divinity, they stubbornly refuse it. or of the truth of his church and stubbornly refuse it. He will do this by the preaching of the church, by the sanctity of the church, 
the church being a lamp for the whole world to see by the sanctity of its doctrines, both its, its dogma and its morals, the sanctity of the saints and the good example of so many good Catholics. It is a holy church. It attracts people who are of the truth because of its truth concerning God. How all of its truths match even the truths of natural religion, what people are able to deduce from their own reason. It all makes sense. And through miracles, the miracles in the early church and the miracles that have happened even as in times after the early church. And he will constantly remind them of their infidelity and of their bad conscience. The sin of infidelity is a terrible sin. We, through naturalism, we are inclined to think of someone as a good person, even if he should not believe in God, or if he should be an agnostic, or a heretic, or something like that. But particularly people who have no belief in God whatsoever, who, or who don't care about God, or don't care about the true religion. That is a very serious sin. We think, oh, they're a good person. You know, they're charitable, they're nice, good fellow kind of thing. That is not true. If you are unfaithful to God, you are committing a very serious sin. Think of Moses descending from Mount Sinai. The Jews were worshiping an idol. And he smashed that idol and threw the Ten Commandments down and broke them in, in the anger and in indignation over the Jews having received the true religion, now worshiping a full, false god. In today's naturalism, you would say, oh, well, you know, they mean well, they're nice people. What of it if they worship a golden calf? That is modern naturalism. But infidelity is a very abominable sin in the eyes of God. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. The first of the commandments to be burned on the stone on Mount Sinai. When the apostles preached, many were converted. 5,000 in one day, it says in the Acts of the Apostles. But yet many others remained unfaithful, and for this they merited eternal salvation. And many do remain unfaithful and merit thereby eternal salvation, uh, eternal damnation. He will convict them of justice inasmuch as he will show them that justice or moral uprightness of the world is false. When you hear justice in sacred scripture, it usually means moral uprightness. It, does, is, it is not restricted to merely rendering to your neighbor what is his due, the way a judge meets out justice from the bench or that you pay your bills. It means justice in the fullest sense of the word, word being right with God. And to the Jews, he will show that their attachment to the Old Testament law is false. And to the Gentiles, he will show that their naturalistic morality is false. And he says, because I go to the Father, that is, those who do not believe in me say that I am merely human and am an imposter but my ascension into heaven and my subsequent sending of the Holy Ghost will prove my divinity in such a way that those who do not believe shall be condemned. Remember, he said that to the apostles. Going therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And, and he who does not believe shall be condemned. And behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world, promising that assistance to his church. I am with you, which means a very, very strong thing in sacred scripture. I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. So those who do not believe shall be condemned. And you shall see me no longer, he says. The very justice or righteousness of his disciples will consist in the fact that they believe without seeing. Remember what he said to St. Thomas, blessed are they who have, belie have, have believed, yet they have not seen. And his ascension also proves that he was not a sinner or an imposter, but truly the Son of God made man. How could he ascend into heaven by his own power in glory, surrounded by angels, except if he were not God? So he therefore proves his divinity not only by his resurrection, but also by his ascension into heaven. And he says, of judgment, because the prince of this world is already judged. This means that the world will see its condemnation, because the Holy Ghost will make the world understand that it is condemned in its head and in its prince. The devil is the prince of this world. He is a condemned criminal and is sentenced. The world imitates the devil by preferring false religions to the true one and by persecuting the church. If God did not spare the angels who rebelled, he will not spare the humans who rebel by following the prince of rebellion, the already condemned and sentenced Lucifer. And he says, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And these things refer to the mysteries of faith, many mysteries of faith, the conversion of the Gentiles, the foundation, and government of the churches, the various churches, that is the dioceses throughout the world, the priests and bishops, then the institution of the hierarchy. They cannot bear them now since without the gift of the Holy Ghost, they are as yet too carnal in their thinking. He therefore makes them look forward to the reception of the Holy Ghost. And he says, but when, the, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you all truth. Now, all truth does not mean all natural truths, such as those of biology and physics, but it refers to everything that pertains to eternal salvation. This teaching of all truth did not happen all at once on Pentecost, but continues in the church throughout all ages. That is, the revelation was closed at the end, at the death of the last apostle, that is, of faith. There was no new revelation after the death of the, the last apostle. But the church uh, examines all of this revelation that is in this deposit of faith, as we call it, and reflects upon it and draws conclusions from it and teaches it and this with the assistance of the Holy Ghost. And that is what is meant here, is that the, the church reflects upon revelation and as heresies particularly show up in the church, looks more and, and harder into what is revealed in order to tell us more about God. And it is for this reason that we pray to the Holy Ghost to enlighten our intellects. It is for the same reason that the Pope, when he is about to make a solemn statement of magisterium, 
prays for enlightenment to the Holy Ghost, that he be preserved from any error. Pius XII mentions that in his document on the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He said, I have prayed again and again and again in order to have this sacred assistance of the Holy Ghost to always persevere in the truth, to always teach the truth. And this has never faltered in the Catholic Church because precisely I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world through the assistance of the Holy Ghost. And our Lord says, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever things he shall hear, he shall speak, and the things that are to come. This means that the Holy Ghost will not speak except in union with the Father and the Son. He is not some separate God, but in union with the Father and the Son. He proceeds from the Father and the Son and is one God with them. The things he shall hear refers to the common divine knowledge of the three persons. St. Augustine says he always hears because he always knows. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth, just as Christ is incarnate truth. And don't forget that Bergoglio denied the single divine essence. First of all, he's, he said, there's no such thing as a Catholic God. Already a blasphemy. And I noticed when, when, uh, when Father Chicada died, I went into his office and he had a glass top on his, on his desk. And I noticed underneath he had a piece of paper that said, there is no such thing as a Catholic God Bergoglio, just to remind himself constantly of the blasphemy of that man. But he also denied the single divine essence. He called it God spray, that there is one divine essence. He said, no, there's only the three persons. If there are only three persons without a single divine essence, then there are three gods. And that's a heresy, a heresy against defined doctrine of the Catholic Church. And so this man, you know, I don't see how anyone could even consider him remotely a Catholic. He also told a little boy who was crying about his dead father, who happened to be an apostate Catholic, an atheist, that his father went to heaven because he said in Italian the equivalent of this, that he was a nice guy. And that's so typically naturalist and modernist that even though he is as guilty as sin, as they say, for not believing in God, for you cannot be an atheist in good conscience. It is impossible. You cannot be an atheist out of ignorance. It is impossible. So that because someone is a nice guy, in an Italian, uomo, uomo bravo, he went to heaven. And this type of thinking gets into our heads today that it really doesn't matter what religion you belong to or if you don't even believe in God as long as you're nice and decent and good in a natural sense. You don't go to heaven for being naturally good. You go to heaven for being supernaturally good. And you can't be supernaturally good unless you have the supernatural virtue of faith which is infused at baptism. It is impossible to please God without faith. The faith is the foundation of the whole spiritual structure. If it crumbles, everything falls down. And that's why the profession of the true faith is extremely important. It is not some bagatelle or your own conscience, what you think about God. The profession of the true faith is extremely important. It's the most important thing in your lives. For everything else in your salvation depends on your profession of the true faith. 
The Holy Ghost, therefore, will reveal to them not only the truth, but future events as well, as we see in St. Paul predicting the great apostasy from the faith, which we are living through today, and the Antichrist, which is you know, coming soon, probably, and, and to many other things that the apostles themselves predicted uh, concerning the end of the world, many things. So the Holy Ghost revealed to them not only the truths of the faith, but also things to happen in the future. There's also the apocalypse of St. John. And he says, our Lord says, he shall glorify me because he shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. The Holy Ghost will glorify Christ by showing him to be the Son of God, the Messiah, and the Savior of the world. He will do this through the theological virtues and through his assistance to his church. His church will be an extension of Christ through time. That is why Christ remains eternally present on the altars. He did not ascend to heaven and leave us simply with a pile of Bibles to look at. He ascended to heaven, leaving us the priesthood, the church, and the Holy Eucharist in our tabernacles. And the Holy Eucharist in ourselves when we come to the communion rail, a, an abiding presence, an abiding assistance of the Holy Ghost to the church, an abiding teaching of the truth, a Pentecost that goes on forever. That's what he has left us with after his ascension into heaven. He says, to receive of mine, and this refers again to the divinity of the Holy Ghost and the unity of the divine persons in one divine essence. All three persons know all truth and speak the same things because they are one God. In proceeding from the Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost knows all things that they know. the word to receive should not make anyone think that the Holy Ghost is lesser or inferior to Christ, but that in proceeding from the Father and the Son from all eternity, he receives all things from them except what constitutes each person as a distinct person. So as persons, they are distinct. As one God, they are the same. Now, what are the lessons to be drawn from this Holy Gospel? The first is the assistance of the Holy Ghost to the Catholic Church. This is key. And this is why the Church teaches with divine authority. If it doesn't teach with divine authority, it is a bogus Church. If it did not claim to teach with divine authority, that would be a sure sign that it's a false Church because Christ said he establishes his church, uh, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the apostles refer to the church many times in their writings. There is a church to belong to. There is a hierarchy to adhere to. And if that institution does not claim infallibility, that is, does not claim the assistance of the Holy Ghost in its teachings. It is waving the flag of being a false, bogus, fake church, a concoction of human beings that will falter and fall down, teach error, like all of the Protestant religions. So this assistance by the Holy Ghost is why the church is infallible in all of its universal teachings, disciplines, and liturgical rites. You can always follow the Catholic Church in its universal teachings, disciplines, and liturgical rites in all good conscience because it is assisted by the Holy Ghost. And this is why the church is indefectible 
That is, it will remain until the end of time as an institution and also, and even more importantly, remain essentially the same in its universal teachings, its disciplines, and its liturgical rites. That is, it cannot substantially alter these things. Yes, the church may change its fasting laws, for example, but it cannot substantially alter the faith or substantially or alter what is taught as the faith in the sacred liturgy. Nor can its disciplines teach you to do something wrong that is unpleasing to God. That is the assistance promised. And that is why the church is indefectible. And secondly, it teaches us the necessity of continuity of doctrine. The Holy Ghost does not give us a new doctrine at any time. God never changes. He is from all eternity. He had no beginning. He never changes. And in the epistles, it says there's not even a shadow of change in God. Therefore, his church does not change. It is a mirror image of God and in his changelessness. Therefore, those in the Novus Ordo hierarchy who teach us a new doctrine and who demonstrate thereby that they lack the assistance of the Holy Ghost are not true popes or true bishops. They do not rule the church because they, they lack this direction, this assistance, this preservation from error. If they are changing our religion, it is an absolutely certain and sure sign that they are what St. Pius X told us they would be. He said in his encyclical that they are all, all the more to be feared, that they are found, these modernists, in the very bosom of the church, even in the clergy. And he did everything he could with tremendous energy and under great criticism, which he repudiated. With great criticism, he pursued these modernists and got rid of them to the best of his ability. But unfortunately, all they did, many of them, was to submerge. They even said to each other, just wait it out. Things will get better. We will have our day. It's in their literature. You can read it. And that's exactly what they did. And they abandoned dogma as for the, the object of their attack. And they went to the liturgy. In the late teens and early 1920s, they turned to the liturgy in order to foster their new doctrines and their perversion of the Catholic Church. And these people rose to positions of apparent authority, being appointed and elected. And this is what they've done. But they are ecclesiastical thugs. That's the only way to put them, to describe them. They are not true representatives of Christ, and they are there only to pervert the Church of Christ. And that's why we take a very firm position about them and against them. Because otherwise, you would have to conclude that the Church has defected. And that is contrary to faith. The third thing to understand from this Gospel is that we will be condemned for infidelity. The Holy Ghost gives sufficient grace to every man to save his soul. No one can say, I, I have been cheated. I did not have a chance. Everyone gets the chance to save his soul. So if you go to hell, you go through your own fault. St. Robert Bellarmine said, no one arrives in hell surprised. If you go to hell, you know why you went to hell. You can think of the unrepented sins that have brought you to hell. Your habits that you never confessed. All the things that would lead a soul to hell, you will know, you will stare at and realize, yes, this is a just sentence. No one will have to tell you. 
This grace, the sufficient grace, includes the grace to know at least some of the truths of the gospel and to accept them by supernatural grace. Everyone gets that. And those who resist this grace are guilty of grave sin and will go to hell. And finally, we should pray to the Holy Ghost for docility to his inspirations. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.